everyone. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and today I am joined by Dr. Wayne Altman. And Wayne is both a local primary care physician here in Arlington, and he is also affiliated with the uh, Tufts University School of Medicine, chair of their family medicine department, and a physician there as well and ha also involved in a couple of other things of note that we will talk about during our conversation. I will just leave that for now. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for being here. I really do. Pleasure, James. Yeah, I really appreciate it. We are here to talk, uh, as the audience is soon going to find out, we're here to talk about crises big, uh, uh, small to very, very large, uh, by which I mean we have a crisis right here in town and in the surrounding areas in terms of our primary care physicians, the number of them, the access to them, et cetera. Then you are willing to, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that you are willing to address the larger, some of the larger crises that are kind of run through our health system, which you and I were talking before we went on air, and we both agree uh, we can do better, and we absolutely need to do better. So this conversation is going to be part of, of that. Um, let me just ask you to start with, uh, I, had, I had said we want to set a larger framework for, uh, what the, for the conversation we're going to talk about. But I will just say, right before we went on air, you, it popped up on your phone that there's an article in the Globe today about this very thing, right? Right. Felice Fryer uh, wrote an article in the Globe that just uh, appeared about 20 minutes ago uh, in my inbox, Primary Care Access in Turmoil, I believe was the headline or something similar to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, uh, this is becoming more and more uh, familiar to people. But I think pretty much everybody, this is not a news flash because anybody who has lost their primary care doctor or has a friend or a family member who is looking for a new primary care doctor for any reason, good luck to them mm -hmm. because they are struggling to find folks. Uh, and uh, in, in, we actually did some uh, numbers in Arlington. Uh, we looked at all the primary care clinicians in Arlington. There are about 40 of them. And close to three quarters of those 40 folks were no longer accepting new patients. And for the handful of folks who were accepting new patients, it was going to be months before you could see them. So that sounds very bad on its face, obviously. But give us a little context for that. So I think you said three quarters. Of the, I, I remember you said, sharing some data with us, 71% close to three quarters, like you said. How does that compare to what a normal situation would usually be in terms of, you know, people who are, you know, physicians in a community who are no longer accepting, you know, able to accept new patients? Well, I would think that every primary care practice should have clinicians accepting new patients. And uh, I will tell you, I am a family physician at Family Practice Group in Arlington on Water Street. and. Uh, our clinicians, we have 12 clinicians, and we're no longer accepting any new patients. And we feel terrible about that. We're embarrassed by that. And at the same time, we have to balance the fact that we need to be available to care for the patients that we have. Yeah, and so what, like, where to start with this gigantic topic, right? Um, let's start here. You, you were saying to me, again, before we went on air, that when you hear from patients, uh, they have three main concerns that come up right away, and none of them is health. Tell us about that, please. Well, so the, the first concern that people have is access. Uh, as we just spoke about, people are struggling to, to even if you do have a primary care clinician, uh, getting an appointment in a timely fashion is a challenge for folks. Uh, getting an appointment with your primary care clinician is a challenge. So every last aspect of access is a challenge in primary care, and people uh, are upset about that. Uh, a second challenge that people report is convenience. Our healthcare system is more set up for the convenience of the healthcare professionals than it is for the people accessing healthcare. Thank you. For, sorry to interrupt, and and I thank you for saying that. Because you're, you, it shows an understanding and empathy for the patient's experience that we as patients, I have to say, you know, speaking from my own experience, and I'm generally content with my health care and my primary care physician, et cetera, but we as patients just don't realize that you actually, you know, that folks do understand that. 
James, about 10 or 15 years ago, I was at a meeting with over 100 doctors and they, a, a CVS Minute Clinic was about to mm -hmm. come into the market. Uh, and people were thinking, this might really take off. Uh, spoiler alert, it did. Um, and um, everyone was up in arms. What can we do to stop this? Something has to be done. And I raised my hand and I asked the group, raise your hand if a patient calls your office today, how reliably can you offer them an appointment today to handle the question that they have that they need access to care for? And very few hands went up. And I said, I agree with everybody's concern, but we are the problem. We are creating a market that CVS and other venture capital firms are filling with different urgent care and CVS Minute Clinic and so on. And so, uh, especially the younger generation has basically said, we're not going to tolerate a lack of convenience. We will find our health care and we will prioritize convenience over quality of care because that's how important it, it is to us. The final category uh, that people are upset about is cost. That's no surprise to anyone either. Healthcare is absurdly expensive. Uh, I recently saw uh, uh, numbers where uh, the average family pays $26,000 per year for the coverage of their family. That is the equivalent of a family buying a new car, to quote Price is Right, uh, every year, okay? Very few families can afford a new car every year. Right, and, and as you're saying, that's the average, right? That's just, okay, everybody's right. generally fine, we're doing checkups, we have... Do you know, dad has to do a colonoscopy, whatever it is, that's just like a normal year. So we right? talked about no extra expense. access, convenience, and cost as the top three con appropriate concerns of patients, and yet health was not mentioned. And our data around achieving better health is not good mm. as a country. We do not perform well compared to other developed nations. And so, uh, it's not that people don't care about health, it's just that the other three are in such bad shape. And then there's a fifth aspect of things that here we are in 2024, and embarrassingly, there are large segments of our society that get worse health care than other segments of our society. There are stark inequities in health care that are unacceptable and are shameful uh, for us to have. And um, all five of these things have to be improved and can be improved. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit because I know there's legislation that you really, you know, that I want to hear more about and that you are uh, very connected to. But let's dig down first a little bit more into the into the PCP kind of the the, the lack of access crisis to to primary care physicians. So um, I would imagine that the problem may be extended in both directions. And by both directions, I mean you have primary care physicians who have been in practice for a long time and are retiring, so you're losing some of the supply there. Then you may also have correspondingly on the, you know, on the, in the, the front end, people just not, uh, medical school students uh, and, you know, choosing other kinds of specialties uh, to go into um, for different reasons. Um, so I'm just speculating that those two things would be factors, but you can, can you just kind of share with us from your own much more expert uh, viewpoint, you know, what is happening that accounts for the fact that here in Arlington, as you said, seven out of 10 are just not taking new, new patients. What, what's going on? Right, so you laid it out exactly correctly. Um, I live in Woburn. We did the same analysis in Woburn, and the numbers were even worse. It was 89% of PCPs in Woburn not accepting new patients. And so this is not unique to Arlington. Um, and um, so uh, we also know that one third of the primary care physician workforce in Massachusetts is over the age of 60 years old. So they're naturally, organically going to age out of this job, except People are retiring early. People mm. are retiring way before 60. People are actually leaving the profession altogether at younger ages. People are reducing their hours significantly uh, to do other things uh, and to preserve their sanity. 
and uh, people are leaving their practice to start direct primary care practices or concierge practices, which take their patient panel from 2,000 patients to 500 patients. So all of these things dramatically and precipitously reduce the primary care workforce and access to primary care. So, you know, some, there's so much of what you just said that, that, that uh, you know, that I want to follow up on. But one thing you said is that people are leaving this particular position within the, the world of doctoring, right? And I've always thought and kind of, I don't know if it's been a received wisdom or sense of sorts that primary care physicians have the highest kind of job satisfaction in some ways because they are dealing directly with the patients that they're helping a lot of the time and, and for any number of other factors like long-term relationships that they have with patients and all that kind of thing has always made me think, well, that's one of the healthier uh, lifestyle uh, that, that a doctor could choose and also one of the more, again, satisfying ones. But you say that people are leaving in droves. What's going on? Well, so let me be clear. I love my job, and uh, I th at my retirement age, I'm projecting to be about 90 because <laughs> I, I love the work I do. Um, but it's a real challenge for a lot of people. Um, and so you also were talking about the pipeline of medical students coming into the profession uh, decreasing, and, and that is also true. Uh, it's, it's either stagnant or decreasing, and it's not nearly enough. Uh, last year, for example, of the 700 or so medical students who graduated our four medical schools in 2023, 5% of them chose family medicine, uh, 5%. Right, and if we go back 20 years, 40 years, that, that number would have been four times that or something? Well, or? Uh, it, it'll be a little bit higher, but it, it's been stagnant okay. and it needs to go higher. And so your question of why, why are folks leaving the profession or dropping their hours, um, that if you also ask the question, why aren't medical students choosing the profession? It's the same answer to both. Because at Tufts Medical School, every medical student does a six week family medicine rotation. Uh, we have hundreds of faculty all over Massachusetts and New England who host them in their offices. Really good folks, hardworking folks, who uh, per the students are doing God's work, mm -hmm. okay? Except they see them doing God's work and then they see them struggling with the system. The job is broken, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, but they see them struggling with this, and they say, I really admire you for doing God's work, and best of luck with that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do something either more lucrative or more or just easier on me. That's right. And on, on, and on my spirit. All right, yes, let us talk more about what you were just saying. What the, the, the position, the system is broken in this particular way. Tell us more about that. Imagine in whatever occupation you have where you work hard and earn a good living or a reasonable living, imagine if at the end of every workday you were asked to stay on for two or three hours extra, but you don't get paid for that time. Routinely, systematically, every day of your work life. Um, that's essentially the story with primary care. We have a system that is called fee-for-service, which means a primary care clinician gets paid for every office visit they have. It's widgets, it's being, getting paid for volume, mm -hmm. and it aligns the incentives perfectly to create the broken system that we have. Um, the way you fix that is you pay primary care per patient, not per visit. Okay, in the current fee-for-service system where you're getting paid for volume, at the end of my workday, I feel a little bit tired, but it's a good tired. I feel like, boy, I hope I helped some people today. This was a, a good day, uh, saw a bunch of folks, helped a bunch of folks, and then I look at my electronic health record and I see 42 messages in my inbox. And here's where the volunteer work begins. Mm. And, um, and so if you're smart as a primary care clinician, in order to try and turn it not into volunteer work, but to actually get paid for your work, you ask your patients to turn it into a formal office visit. Mm. So you either ask them to take a half day off of work and come in and see you, which did they need to do that for a five minute question? I don't think so, mm -hmm. right? Or you ask them to get on a video and they may or may not have the technology to, to manage that video, um, or, um, uh, or it's just annoying. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so let me make sure I understand this and the audience understands sure. this well. The volunteer work you're talking about, or those those two or to three extra hours at the end of every day, is really basically because people are trying to ac get access to you, perhaps with very simple questions, perhaps with something more than that. And everywhere in but between. They, and in, everywhere in between. And they can't during the regular office hours, so they're emailing you, and you then have a choice of responding and creating that, again, just extra hours of work that you're doing. Pajama time, uh, sometimes people call it. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's probably the only good thing about having to answer emails as opposed to seeing patients is you can dress however you want to do it. That's true. Do so. Um, but so, and, and then what, you, what you're saying is, so people... Uh, the, the incentive for the doctors in those cases is to basically turn those email exchanges into something more formal that can be recognized the way the system works That's right, right now. Now imagine, James, if I was paid per patient instead of per office visit. Now my job is to take care of my patients. That's it. So if they have a quick question, I could shoot them a text back. I could do a quick phone call. We could get on video, so you could show me that thing on your arm real quick, mm -hmm. okay? You don't need to take a half day off of work to navigate all the inconveniences of the healthcare system to get these small and quick things taken care of. And uh, so when you pay people that way, it aligns incentives to actually promote convenience mm -hmm. and promote better healthcare and better access to care. So what are the main obstacles to doing to making such a transformation? Is it, is it that the, what I would assume, being rather cynical about these things, that the powers that be are doing just fine, you know, somebody's doing just fine the way the system is, and they're not willing to relinquish what they, what they would need to in order to improve it for others, or what? I would suggest that that's the biggest barrier to any change. There was, uh, forgive me, I don't remember their names, there were a group of psychologists who won the Nobel Prize of Economics about 20 years ago, uh, doing a study that showed that there's far more pain in losing what you have than there is in not getting what you think you deserve. <laughs> and so there are some haves in our healthcare system who are doing really well and don't wish to relinquish any of this. Even though what I'm about to talk to you about actually is in their best interest in terms of a long-term investment. When I say long-term, I'm talking a few years, that's it. Okay, and excellent segue, because we do want to spend uh, the time that remains uh, to talk about potentially something that can improve. I mean, I'm sure it's more than potential the ways in which it can improve it. It's potential that it will happen, right? And that is a bill currently, a, a, a state senate bill, uh, S750, I believe it is. That's correct. That you are going to tell us about. Please do. Okay, so we've put a coalition together five years ago to start working on this legislation. Well, the first person I met with to discuss this idea was Senator Cindy Friedman, who many people in this audience, I'm sure, are familiar with. Yes. And the senator interrupted me warmly after about five minutes and said, I get it. I understand how important primary care is. Let's figure out how to write this bill, and then we will write it. And she was true to her word. And in January of 2023, 14 months ago, this legislation was filed. Uh, and uh, it, the, the, the letters and numbers are S.750. We call it Primary Care for You or PC for You. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a website, PC for You, which YOU.org. Uh, that you can learn a little bit more about it. Um, and we've been meeting with stakeholders. You might say, what took you so long? Uh, we've been meeting with stakeholders in healthcare uh, as well as patients all over the state uh, to try and put this legislation together. Uh, our former president uh, once said, who knew healthcare was so complicated? Maybe everyone but him. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, it's really complicated. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many details that need to be attended to. And this is 20 pages of legislation. It's pretty complicated, but we think we've got it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, obviously it's, it, it's a great coalition, a promising coalition to begin with when you and Cindy Friedman get together right from the get-go, and she being having years and years of experience um, in the State House, knowing how things work there and how 
you know, what is palatable, et cetera. And then you know, you, you and your partners, of course, knowing what needs to be in this in order to actually have change right. uh, go forward. So what, you know, if you, if you, I invite you to, if you want to share any of the specific, you know, elements or stipulations within that legislation that would be, you know, a particular kind of relevance for, for, for folks listening. So in Massachusetts, which is a hair better than many other states, but in Massachusetts, for every dollar spent on health care, we spend six cents on primary care. And if you look at developed countries that have way better health outcomes than we do, they spend about 12 to 15 percent on primary care, which is really the sweet spot. And primary care has a triple superpower, James. Uh, it produces better health and less health inequities for less cost. You get more for less. And we choose in our infinite wisdom to underinvest in the one aspect of healthcare that gives you more for less. In 2021, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine did this huge report. And basically this 100 page report concluded that primary care is the only aspect of healthcare that delivers better health and equity at the same time. There is no other aspect of healthcare that can deliver those things all at a lower cost. You know, you say that, and uh, I don't know, some in the audience might say, come on, really? But to me, I'm like, my, my, uh, my frustration in, in hearing this is based on the fact that uh, that is something that I've understood for a really long time, and that we all get that message, we all. Uh, people who are lucky enough and privileged enough and educated enough to be, you know, uh, accessing the resources of around our own health that we can. In other words, the information that's available out there. We get that message loud and clear. Yeah, it's, it's not just having a primary care clinician. Mm -hmm. It's having a personal physician. Mm -hmm. Because the engine of that output that we were just talking about is the relationship. Mm -hmm. It's all about the relationship because um, you can go to ChatGPT and learn a great deal and get your questions answered. But you, you might not understand exactly what they mean. So to have your physician be able to explain it to you, but explain it to you through an understanding of a context of who is James? What's his family like? What's important to James? What is James's culture? Mm -hmm. What are some cultural considerations that might be important to James? Those are the things. The relationship aspect of family medicine cannot be replaced by artificial intelligence, at least not in the next 20 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 20 years or slash that by, you know, whatever the, art, the artificial intelligence manufacturer's uh, own, you know, ambitions are. But uh, that's a conversation for a future date, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, to me... Again, it has been perfectly obvious. You talk about dentistry. You talk about all different kinds of aspects of one's health. If you take good care of yourself, if you have good maintenance, if you have a good relationship with somebody who knows you and also knows what is the healthiest for you, i.e. your PCP, how is that not going to make for a more efficient, more cost-effective, uh, and again, less crisis to crisis kind of veering from from crisis to crisis uh, situation than, than uh, you know, as we have now. Quick story for you, James. I, I have a family member who was having a health crisis and was in a local emergency department. Uh, and uh, I joined her at nine o'clock after I was finished with my work uh, in the evening. And I went into that emergency department and she was one of 80 people waiting in the emergency department. Uh, for care that she needed quite urgently. And I looked around and I saw people anguishing. Uh, and I knew that at least half, if not more, if having access to primary care would not need to be sitting there for 10 to 15 hours in that emergency department. Because I have a little bit of privilege as a physician, I called around to some other emergency departments and they basically all told me, no, we're in the same situation. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna really improve anything by driving 10 mm -hmm. miles down the road to our emergency department. And so think about the cost 
of an office visit at a primary care office versus an emergency medicine visit where they don't have that relationship, so they need to order more tests and studies, mm -hmm. which generates more cost. This is what we're doing. This is the short-sighted way that we're doing this. So to get back to the legislation, primary care for you, it does a few things. The first thing it does is it doubles primary care investment, setting, taking from 6% to 12%. The second thing it does is it creates a payment structure for primary care that is now per patient instead of per office visit, per, per volume. Mm -hmm. It's per value instead of for volume, mm -hmm. okay? And um, the third thing it does is when you go to the primary care doctor with this legislation, no copay, no deductible. Primary care has this superpower that we talked about, and yet we create an obstacle course between the patient and their primary care clinician. Uh, that makes no sense. Patients should not have to decide, can I afford my visit to the primary care? Yeah, I have to say, you know, we're, 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 we did not ask you here, uh, you know, to, to kind of proselytize for this bill on the one hand. On the other hand, come on, folks. I mean, <laughs> this, this, this is just, it just, it's like a no-brainer because, again, any legislation that, that has any of the components that you just mentioned would have to be an improvement on what we are currently dealing with. Nobody, I don't think, nobody that I know of in my own experience is satisfied uh, in, a, in a fundamental way with the way that things work um, around their primary care physician and access to the health system. Uh, this seems to have real promise. Um, I certainly, speaking for myself, and I imagine other people, I certainly hope that you, that Cindy Friedman, that the various sponsors within uh, the legislature and those groups who are promoting and, and supporting this bill are successful at the very least because this is, this is an important step. I'm sure it's no panacea. So uh, I, I want to tell you one more thing, James, before mm -hmm. we wrap up, and that is that uh, your viewers might be wondering, how are we going to pay for this, the 6% going to 12%? What is this money going to be? Is all these doctors just going to get a raise? Is that what's going on here? Um, and that is not the case. The money is used to invest in enhanced services at the primary care office, things like addiction care, mental health care, community health workers, group visits, medical scribes, all kinds of things that enhance primary care and create a robust team. Because when you create a robust team at a primary care office, that produces more capacity for them to take care, uh, better care of patients and, and more patients they have a, uh, an ability to take care of. This bill pays for itself because primary care decreases the overall cost. And this bill is budget neutral for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Not one dollar of tax money would go to this bill. Well, I mean, I'm not sure you can make any better argument than you just have um, for the value of the bill. And again, I hope that it is a receptive audience out there. People should, I, I assume, as with most legislation, you just want the, anybody who's listening here and saying, yeah, that's a good idea to make sure that they make their views known to their legislators. That and, would be great. Uh, and on from there. All right, I have been speaking with Dr. Wayne Altman about a lot of important things related to our health system and especially the primary care physician shortage of uh, access and in the numbers. Um, I, I expect that we will have Wayne back as long as you agree uh, for future conversations because this one is far from over. Uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time to come in today to talk to us and I am sure that you will have more to tell us in the future. Thank you so much. Best of luck with that legislation especially. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you as well for taking your time to join us today. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We'll see you next time.